Hello everyone, my name is Mathieu Henry. I go online as Pizu1 from Ribbon, and I've been doing um, JavaScript intros for quite a few years now. Welcome to this seminar for Love by 2024 called JavaScript and Demosyn Science Coding. Um, for this talk, uh, this is roughly a plan. I will talk about JavaScript, a bit of the history of Demosyn, uh, or the web Demosyn the limits and what you can expect uh, from these type of predictions, how to get some visuals, some audio, uh, how to create a render loop, putting it, all of this together. And we'll talk a bit about compression and how to bring new talents uh, to, to a scene. Uh, so let's start with JavaScript and the web platform. Uh, typically we talk about JavaScript intros and JavaScript predictions, but uh, JavaScript goes hand in hand with the web platform. Uh, you, we need the web platform and the web browser to, to render things, to, to display our JavaScript. Um, and the web was made public in 1991. Uh, it's everywhere now. Uh, it's inside your pocket, on your laptop, on your desktop, on your fridge, in your car, everywhere. It has pretty cool capabilities. Um, can render text, images, audio, videos. It can record a webcam. Can also listen to sound and so on. Or have some different sensors to know the orientation of your device, battery level, this kind of things. Um, because it's so popular, um, it's relatively easy to make web pages, and most pages are shit. <laughs> Let's try this. Um, Normally, the web servers need to declare the content type so that the browser knows what they are dealing with, but web servers return whatever they want. Um, and because of that, the browsers can't trust them. They have to do some, some tricks, some content sniffing. They have to load the first kilobytes of any resource we receive and make sure that it matches the content type that was sent or declared by the web server. Uh, and also, because the most pages are not great, <laughs> Uh, the various parsers, the HTML parser and CSS parser, have to be really forgiving. Uh, looking at the line of code below, uh, we get an opening EM, uh, which is closed here. Then in the middle, we get an opening div, but, but div is not closed. So the parser defines the rules to handle this kind of situations. Should it create a closing div here, or should it split the div so that it can spill over outside? Uh, the HTML parser defines these rules uh, because it's really the type of content that the browsers receive and have to deal with in in a graceful way. Uh, some the CSS parser also has to do these kind of things. Here we define some style and we see the color RGB and then uh, with the values and we are missing a closing parenthesis. So the CSS parser also defines how to handle these things. Uh, talking about colors. Uh, we have a million ways to declare colors in JavaScript or on the web, and that's pretty cool. Uh, like when you want to make an intro, you want to use some colors or even shades of colors. Uh, we can have keywords like pink, but also red, gold, aqua, lime, black, anything you want. Uh, we have the shorthand hexadecimal values, shorthand hexadecimal values with alpha, uh, the long version uh, with RGB. The long version of RGB A, we can also specify RGB values as a string with uh, decimal values or with percentage, or the alpha. We can also access the HSL color space, uh, specify the alpha, but there's also more color space coming to the web, like lab, okay lab, CLH, okay CLH, and, and more and more. And so the web platform is really evolving constantly, which is pretty cool. Um, JavaScript uh, came in December 95 uh, to bring some interactivity to the web, uh, which until then was just like a document format. Uh, JavaScript is prototypal and loosely typed. What it means by prototypal, it means that there is a prototype chain uh, that, unlike typical or classical object-oriented programs, uh, there's like a chain of prototype where the scope of the object and the parent objects leaves, uh, which means that their properties are accessed along this prototype chain. So in the first two lines of code here, 
uh, we do a rotation using the math.cos and math.scene functions. And in the last two lines, uh, we do with math, so that we put math on top of the prototype chain, and then cos and scene are directly available in the prototype chain. So we can save a few characters, and you see that the code is much shorter. And we can abuse that for many, uh, in many ways, uh, in many places. Uh, I mentioned that it's loosely typed, uh, so JavaScript, because it does not have strong typing, must do a lot of type uh, casting or coercion. Uh, so in the last, these two lines here, uh, we have a variable foo, which is a um, string with a heart emoji. And if we do if foo, uh, we will shout love byte. And that code will shout love byte because foo is, is not a Boolean, but it's a string uh, with a heart emoji. It's nothing like zero, null, false, undefined. So it's kind of Truthy, uh, so that's good enough, and then we will shout love byte. Uh, again, this is something you need to know, and it becomes useful because then you don't need to cast uh, things in different types. Um, another cool thing is that um, in the early days, <laughs> the browsers did were competing, and standards were not really responsive. Um, so browsers invented a few things, <laughs> took a few shortcuts, and that's kind of how we got global identifier. So if in your markup you get an element with an ID, these IDs are unique. And while normally you should do, say, document or query selector hash C to use a CSS selector to find this element, or document dot get element by ID C uh, to access this canvas, you can just use C, the ID, the global identifier, which is pretty neat. Um, another cool feature of JavaScript is called template strings. Um, so that's these backtick strings, like here and here. What template strings do is that they will evaluate everything which is inside this dollar curly braces uh, part and inject it into a string and then return the string. Uh, in that case, we'll get uh, C style, which is a filter of scale, and it will be grayscale 1 or 0 if the part is odd or even. And if a template string is going right after a function, um, <coughs> that function will be called with the string as argument. Uh, so in the second line, we'll call get context with string 2D as argument. Again, yeah, pretty, pretty neat features uh, to, to know and exploit. Now let's go into the history of demo scene and size coding of the web. So JavaScript landed around end of 95, and people started really quickly to have fun and do interactive things. But the first example of really, really um, demo scene activity uh, that I found was in December 99, uh, Web 4096, organized by Zidane of Satori. And let's open it. And we can see. Uh, yeah, a few intros in four kilobytes uh, that are yeah, pretty neat for the time. Here's a little game. Some kind of intro, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Again. December 99. Um, the next example was 256b.htm in March 2002, organized by Mados from TAP and Wild Mac. Uh, that one was pretty cool because that's the uh, first time that the web and size coding went really, really far. Um, you can see the um, competition page here, uh, some example of Intros again, like 256 bytes is uh, is not a lot, and that was 20 years ago. Mm. But uh, yeah, that, that was the time of uh, Internet Explorer, so many of these things don't work so well today. Uh, the next example was uh, in 2005. Um, the assembly had started to make a browser demo competition. But that was, until then, it was dominated by Flash. 
And in 2005, Gasman came with a 64 kilobyte intro and just won the competition and blew everyone away. Uh, and that's when Demosin uh, web, Demosin intros and demos uh, became to be taken seriously. Before it was just a toy, uh, but now people saw that there was some potential. Um, the next big thing with regard to the demo scene in, uh, on the web was September 2010 with JS1K, this uh, web contest about making something cool in one kilobyte with HTML, 2D canvas, or 3D canvas. Um, that was extremely popular. There was over 400 uh, entries and some really cool one inspired by the demo scene. Uh, this one is, is great. <laughs> it's one kilobyte is 14 years. What more do you want? Um, one year later, came Demo.js, the first um, demo scene party to embrace the web. Uh, and there was some one kilobyte intros and some demos. Uh, and also notably, there was some of the very first uh, 3D or WebGL intros on the web, in one kilobyte especially. Uh, the next year came Assembly 2012 with the first uh, JavaScript prod in the size compo. Uh, the next year, Shader Toy came out. Uh, not sure I need to introduce Shader Toy, but just for just for kicks, here it is. Uh, so it's a small playground where you can type some code, uh, some shader code, and run it and see it like. Uh, and people have become really creative with it. Uh, 2016, Twitter came out. Twitter.net. Uh, Twitter is really interesting because it takes the playground ID uh, and bring it really to a very minimalized uh, setting. Uh, people only have 140 bytes and usually the code starts with these bars that are moving and people can do anything they want. Uh, sorry, looking for something really, really cool that I saw earlier today. Look at this. And the code is 137 bytes. That's just mind blowing. And this one, <laughs> what's going on? Um, and April 2020, uh, Twiggle.app came out. Uh, it's, it's another um, shader playground, which is really, really cool. And it supports many options. Uh, you can define uh, what kind of um, what kind of OpenGL uh, binding you want, or versions you want. Uh, and I really recommend you to look for uh, Twiggle on social media. There are some incredibly nice intros and shaders. Okay, moving on to the limits and expectations one can have about tiny JavaScript intros. So we've seen a bit about the history, uh, what people have done over the past few years, but really what, what can you do? What are the typical size that people uh, target and what can you expect from that? So we can just look at uh, what's happening on Puet, starting from four kilobytes for JavaScript. And if we look at the screenshots, just briefly, I think some of these are really impressive visually. Um, let's look at this one. The visuals can really, they can compete with native for kilobyte intros. Uh, so you get really nice music, impressive visuals. Uh, yeah. I don't think anyone would be surprised to see this with native code. Uh, this is really impressive for JavaScript and four kilobytes.
down to one kilobyte, what can we expect? So clearly we can see that uh, just from the screenshots that the rendering becomes a little bit more simple. Um, but yeah, there's still some, some things that look a bit impressive. Um, let's look at no space. This is one kilobyte in JavaScript. X2 plus Y2, 0.5T. XYT equals X slash 4 carat Y slash 4T. XYT equals X slash Y asterisk. Nice, but more simple, <laughs> clearly. Um, now down to 512 bytes. Again, just judging from the screenshot, you can see that there's a clear difference. Type of rendering people achieve. Uh, much less 3D, much more simple uh, things. And typically, um, no sound at that level. In 256 bytes, uh, we see that the, uh, the rendering becomes a lot more primitive. Um, yeah, <laughs> or oh, very primitive. Some remain really impressive of size, and there's almost never any sound, or the sound is limited or the main component of the intros. At 128 bytes, uh, we also see that the number of productions is really decreasing, uh, and very primitive rendering. Uh, and to my knowledge, this is the only animated 128 bytes in JavaScript. So very, very little animations. 64 bytes, uh, 64 bytes. Yeah, again, very limited. Just simple procedural graphics. That's about it. Um, so it gets a, an idea of the landscape of what you can expect uh, from the different sizes of JavaScript productions. Now, let's see how we can actually make some JavaScript productions. So first is that we need to get some shiny pixels. We need to get some pixels on screen. The web has many capabilities, many ways to draw things, uh, and one of them is SVG. SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. It's a, it's a separate language uh, that can be embedded in uh, HTML pages to do vector graphics. Uh, with that, we can do paths, filters, gradients, displacement maps, blending. Uh, it's really powerful, but because it's its own separate language, uh, it's declarative, so it's pretty verbose. And also the perf are not great. Uh, let's look at some example. Uh, I'll go quickly. Um, so yeah, here you see just these few lines uh, create some turbulence effect. But of course you can adjust uh, the frequencies so that you can get some different styles and you could also go ahead and render some textures with that. Uh, and now this gets interesting. You can do displacement based on turbulence. Uh, so you see how you can displace an image based on some noise. Um, and of course you can animate it, which gets pretty fun. Yeah, here you can see that. And the code is it's fairly small. Um, and here's another example of uh, using uh, turbulence displacements to create uh, squiggly text. And uh, you can go beyond and create procedural texture using turbulence, blending them, uh, applying like uh, color filters. So really cool, but um, 
a bit difficult to use all this in very tiny intros. CSS is a cascading style sheet, uh, and it is the language to style web pages. Uh, it has gradients, blending, filters, you can specify under text, you can also do 3D with it. Um, here is a pretty nice intro, 256 bytes, uh, that combines blending and gradients. You can look at the code briefly. Uh, what happens is we have a body, a script type. Um, we have the style of the body, set the height, full height, set the blending mode to defense, and then we have an interval where we run some code often, where we will set the background of the body to a bunch of gradual gradients at some x, y, or dancing x, y positions. Uh, and that creates these beautiful patterns. Um, I've been using CSS 3D a little bit, uh, but I found it to be too verbose uh, and too slow when you have many elements. So I use it in Voltra. I will pause lower a bit of So to show you what happens or how I use CSS 3D, I would like you to focus on what is happening here in the middle of it as I skim through. See how the text is moving? Mm. Oh, not the text, but the entire canvas. And assuming to be a viewer. Uh, and it's not obvious right now uh, because I'm trying to go fast, but the entire canvas is panning in 3D and tilting uh, across multiple axes. And so that gave a nice, um, a nice visual effect uh, to, to the whole intro. Uh, without spending too many bytes. Uh, Canvas is a 2D graphics API uh, where you can do shapes, uh, draw images, but also canvases on top of each other, applying some different blending modes, filters, text, and paths. And the paths are pretty cool. Uh, this is the API I use most. I use, I use in XP, M22, in this Quine, in Monospace, Outer M2, uh, in this tiny game, in Voltra. Yeah. It's a, it's a really, really a nice API, pretty fast, um, and pretty compact. And of course, you have WebGL, which basically gives OpenGL ES bindings uh, to the web. Uh, so it's, it's a bit verbose, uh, the setup uh, to get the WebGL app is 400 to 600 bytes, but you get Unlimited power. It's extremely powerful. <laughs> so now that we saw how to get some uh, some shiny pixels on screen, it would be cool to have some nice tune. About making music itself, I refer you to this talk from Pestis last year at Load Byte called Music in Tiny Intros, where he explains how to make music, how to compose music. Uh, out of nothing, <laughs> starting from nothing, and building your instruments uh, with code or building some tools to create music. Uh, that was really good. Cool. Hi, Pestis. <laughs> so to make music on the web, uh, there are a couple of ways. Uh, the oldest one is to create an audio element. Uh, the audio element takes a source and then you can play it. So the way to do it is create a data URL uh, for an audio web file, and then you create a big loop that will append your by bit expression, uh, in short, all the crazy formulas to generate your sound, create a new audio element, and call that to base64 and play the audio element. Um, we, the bad thing about this is that it can be tricky to synchronize when the sound and audio, oh, the sound and visuals, sorry. Um, another way to go is to use an audio buffer source. So you create an audio context, create a buffer of the size you want and the frequency you want, get the channel data of that audio buffer, 
and then populate it with your float bit. So all the crazy formulas to design the sound. Create a buffer source, set a buffer connected to a destination and start. Uh, another method which is deprecated but still working uh, is to use a script processor. So again, create a new context, create a script processor with a buffer size that you desire, connect it to the destination, and then this script processor will get an audio process event whenever a new chunk of sound is required. So uh, then you can get the output buffer, get the channel data, and generate a new chunk of audio uh, for the next audio frame. Uh, it's pretty neat because then uh, you know exactly when to generate the sound. The problem is that it's on the main thread, so you get some performance issues with that. There are some other ways. There is audio worklets, which is like a modern version of the script processor, which works on another thread. Uh, but it, because it works on another thread, then you get uh, a bit more juggling between the threads and how to set it up and so on. You can also use audio nodes, like oscillators and gain nodes and filters. Uh, but it's more tricky to create um, nice sounds, nice music, uh, and also it takes many bytes. Uh, you can use WebGL, uh, like people do in native intros, but also on Shader Toy, on Twiggle, um, to use the GPU to create a, what would be treated as the audio buffer and then send that to the sound card. And also you can use the speech synthesis. Okay. So we saw how to get some shiny pixels, how to get a cool tune, how do you get, how do you render all of that uh, and in a loop? Uh, the most basic way is to use set interval. Uh, set interval will call this function at uh, this interval in millisecond, and this is how you can update your visuals. Uh, the cleaner way is to call request animation frame, which will Call any method you want for the next frame, for the next uh, frame that the browser needs to render. So the browser will take care of the refresh rate of your device if your tab is focused or not and uh, all the battery saving options, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, with set interval, you risk uh, starving the CPU and having uh, things stuttering. Uh, one way uh, one render loop that I really like, which is really dirty, is to abuse the audio process event uh, of a script processor and abuse it to render not only the audio buffer but also the visuals. Uh, the problem is that the size of the buffers that you can deal with depends or is a multiple of uh, power of two. The frequency is not under your control. Uh, it depends on the drivers, on the browser, on the OS. So you might end up with some strange frame rate, but at least uh, the nice thing is that you get a single update to update your visuals and your buffer, uh, which allow to really synchronize uh, audio and visuals. So now let's try to put it all together. Um, so I would like to dive into XP, uh, the one kilobyte intro that I made uh, last summer with Pestis. Let's open it in a new tab and just start briefly. the code. Um, okay. Here's XP. So the markup just says click and we have a canvas and a script element. If we expand that, it's basically a on click handler. Uh, the click is because, like I said uh, before, 
uh, most web pages are, are terrible uh, and many web pages have been putting auto playing audio and videos uh, when you open them so you would open the video or sorry a web page and you would have sound blasting through your headphones uh, which was terrible so now the browsers require a user action to play sound or videos so that's why you need a, a click handler uh, one of the first things we do is uh, to get hold of a, of a canvas element and the 2d context uh, we get a couple of uh, shortcuts to be seen mean and pi functions create an audio context a script processor which connect to a destination and here we get our render loop the audio process event in the one of the first thing we do is that we reset the canvas uh, the width and height uh, we get hold of the channel data, so the buffer where we will output the sound. Here we have basically the gist of the sound synthesis uh, by Bestis. Uh, so we look through all the samples of our script processor buffer, 2048 in this case. Uh, our buffer is in the variable called D. And that's what we do towards the end. We populate G at the index I, and we increase our variable T the time uh, by one divided by the sample rate. We need to do that because we don't control the, the sample rate. Uh, as I said, it depends on the browser, the drivers, the OS. Uh, and then we have a few visual effects, um, display some kind of horizon or ellipses. Um, a twister that uh, works with polar coordinates, just draws one line and then move a little bit or very small angle and draw another line and so on and so on. Some post-processing event uh, things. Uh, this one is rather interesting. Uh, so we have a variable t, lowercase t, and the variable uppercase t. When our time is greater than a big time, big t, uh, we increase the big time and we get our canvas here, we call two data URL image JPEG and we split that. Uh, what that will do is that it will create a JPEG image out of our canvas as a data URL, so basically a URL with uh, the entire content of the JPEG and we split every character. Uh, so now in this variable JPEG we have basically an array of the bytes that represent the, the JPEG version of our canvas. And a bit later, uh, we we will glitch a random character of that JPEG, which we'll is set it to zero. And the last thing we do is we set the style of the canvas, because if you see, we didn't style it at all, so the canvas would be pretty small, or uh, just the size that we define here, at the beginning of our audio process event. So the last thing we do uh, before finishing the frame is style it. Uh, we set it to position fixed, top left uh, zero, so uh, the top left corner, uh, full width and height, and we apply some filter uh, that will set to grayscale, they, depending on some parts, or which parts of the intro we are. And we do a radial gradient on the entire canvas. What it does is some kind of vignetting which is cool, and um, also you can see that I'm using uh, four, di uh, four digits hexadecimal value, so it's black with four out of 16 opacity. And uh, we use our JPEG, which we join again to recreate the data URL, uh, so that will also inject as a background the glitch JPEG version of our canvas. And that's about it. Yeah, that wasn't too hard. <laughs> okay, um, maybe, okay, if you look at the code here, uh, my cursor says that XP is 5,800 bytes. Uh, so we need to compress that, that's way too much. There are different ways to do it. Um, and the cool thing is that, again, the web is uh, equipped to deal with compression. Um, one of the most common format is deflate and PNG. PNG images are using the 
deflate a uh, compression algorithm, and web browsers know how to decompress JPEGs, or oh, PNGs, sorry. Um, so, and like I said, uh, the web servers tend to send the wrong content type to web browsers, so web browsers have to do some content sniffing, which allows us to abuse this. Uh, we can create a polyglot file, which is part PNG, part HTML, uh, that will contain, at the end, uh, a bit of HTML that will read the pixels of a PNG, put them into a string, and evaluate that string as JavaScript. And the PNG itself is basically take the source code of your intro, put that into a PNG image, like a grayscale image, compress it, and because it's an image, there are many algorithms to compress it very well, uh, and there are many tools to deal with that. Uh, there's one tool online called Tercer Online by Sam, and let's grab the source code of XP, just the, the source code itself, inject it into the input, and here it does uh, just some minifier. But if we change the packing method, uh, we see that it went from 5.7k to 2k, um, and we go to softly and deflate, goes down to almost 1.3k. Uh, one of the cool things is that because it's deflate and softly, uh, there are many tools already available to deal uh, and optimize deflate compression. We can get a heat map uh, that will show how hot every byte was. Uh, if it's hot, it means that it did not compress well. If it's cold, uh, cold color, it means that it compressed very well. Uh, and that's really useful to understand where you are wasting some bytes and how to shuffle your code or reorganize your code to optimize it. Uh, and here you can download and you get a polyglot file, which is part PNG, part HTML. Uh, with some extras to uh, provide the canvas and so on. Really, really cool tool. Uh, the new kid on the block is Brotly. Hmm. Brotly 11. Uh, Brotly is about 10, 12 years old uh, now. It's a new compression format with more tricks than deflate. And also it's really made for web content. So it comes primed with a dictionary that was uh, created based on the corpus of millions of web pages, uh, so that any web page will compress very well uh, by default. Uh, and you easily get 20 to 25% uh, better compression ratio out of the box. The problem is that it's still a little bit of a black box. There are not many tools, and it's a bit uh, tricky to deal with. Also, uh, another caveat is that Web or oh, demos in competitions typically open the, uh, the demos from the file system. And from the file system, you cannot specify the broadly uh, encoding. So you need a tiny, tiny web server. So make sure to check with the demo uh, of the competition organizers if you can provide a small web server to do it. It just takes like five or six lines of code, but make sure that it's allowed before you go in that route. So we've seen a bit how to make some intros, like really by hand, uh, but what about welcoming creative coders that have been using all these playgrounds like Twitter, Shader Toy, Twiggle, and so on. Well, for Twitter, uh, because it's really simple, uh, it's just a 2D canvas with a couple of utilities, uh, you can use a very tiny bootstrapper. Uh, it's 190 bytes, roughly, uh, where you inject your code here. Uh, and with that, you can target 256 and 512 bytes. I said 256 because maybe you don't need all these things, uh, all these um, utilities that come from Twitter. Uh, and then you can trim the fat a bit. Um, Another popular playground is Twiggle and Shader Toy. Uh, and with, for these, you can target one to four kilobytes. Uh, Twiggle does not show it to you, but it injects four to five kilobytes of extra methods uh, to give you access to some 2D and 3D noise methods. 
um, and all the tooling to deal with multi-buffering. Uh, shader toy is much simpler, but you still inject many uniforms. Uh, we can look at uh, a tiny YGL example, and you see that uh, the source code to have one shader uh, running is pretty compact. Um, I have it here. And not minified is 1.3k, uh, but that easily compresses down to about four to 600 bytes. Uh, you have here, oh, you have a canvas uh, that we that has no margin. We have, we have our vertex shader, a uh, fragment shader, and then we try to program, compile the vertex and fragment shader get a uniform for the time, and then draw uh, that buffer. Um, and let's open a example from Shader Toy and see how much work it is to get that working. Oh, somewhat working. So let's get this. Mm. So, because now we are using um, version 3.0.0, uh, we no longer pass arguments to the to the main method. Uh, for the UV, I will just use the JL point code. And um, Shadow Toy uses I time, and I just call mine time. So let's see what we get. I swear it worked. Anyways, um, and an even better example <laughs> is on the WebGL2 fundamentals. Uh, we have a whole section uh, about running Shader Toy from from scratch. So you have the, the most basic shader uh, with a mouse coordinate as well. And you see the code is, is not too big. It's, uh, there's, it's, there's a lot of space, many comments, so we can optimize that a lot. And of course, you can get almost a full shader toy. Uh, a bit more code. And you can do the same exercise for Twiggle. Uh, talking about newcomers and uh, pretty cool playgrounds, there's Push Broadly by Evil, uh, which is really, really cool. <laughs> and yesterday, a new version of Push Broadly was released. Uh, so you have this playground to create shaders, but also audio synth. And the wild thing is, is a Simple button, button, make a demo <laughs> that creates a web page that is your demo. Uh, 
and what we're seeing now is three kilobytes just generated with one click of a button from a tool from a web playground you see 3025 bytes I, I think Bosch Broly will shake the next four kilobytes uh, competitions, and that's cool. There will be some new blood. With all that, um, just have fun, make cool shit, and uh, I'm looking forward to see what you guys do. All right, see you.